again, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Geostrata Extra. We are excited. This is our first extra of 2024 from the February-March issue. This is season five of Geostrata Extra, if you can believe it, since we started this little experiment back in the summer of 2020. My name is Brad Keeler. I'm the director of the Geo Institute. And I am not in lovely Chicago, as you might suspect. You know, you can look behind me, but this is all CGI, people. That's the lovely Chicago River dyed green in honor of St. Patrick's Day. Hopefully, all of you get to get out and do something a little bit Irish this week, wherever you are. If you don't know, Geostrata Extra features an article from the current issue where we go behind the scenes a little bit. That article's editor interviews the author, maybe about things that didn't make it into the article, maybe about things that you have more questions about, and we'll talk about how you ask those questions in just a moment. If you don't know anything about the Geo Institute, I always wonder how people get here who don't. But just in case, after you watch this today, head over to geoinstitute.org. There you will find out we are a technical society with about 12,000 members, most of whom are geotechnical engineers and or geologists. And we are part of the American Society of Civil Engineers. If you like what you see today, and I think you will, it will be gripping content, I predict. You should like, subscribe, and get notifications, and we will let you know every time we post something to the YouTube channel. Now, today's presentation. If you do have questions for our authors, put those in the chat box right to the right. That's two rights in a row of the window in which you are watching this, and we will get to it at the end of the presentation. Here today to talk about the 2023 Turkey-Syria earthquakes, we have Tuche Basher from the University of Illinois, Sissy Nikolaou from NIST, Osgun Numanoglu from Schnabel Engineering, and here to moderate everything and make it all magically work is Mary Nodine of FHWA and one of our editors from Geostrata. Mary, make it happen. All right, this is going to be gripping. I'm so excited. Welcome everyone to the latest episode of Geostrata Extra. As, as Brad said, in this series, one of the magazine editors, that's me, interviews the author or authors, in this case, of an article in the most recently published issue. And we use these sessions to delve more deeply into one article and get added insights on the article and the overall issue theme. So my name is Mary Nodine. I am a geotechnical engineer with the Federal Highway Administration Resource Center. I've been an editor with Geostrata for seven years, and I've been the magazine's resident geopoet since 2008. Today, I will be speaking with Tuche Basar, Osgun Nomonoglu, and Sissy Nicolaou, who co-authored or jo jointly authored the article, A Shifting Landscape, How Cascading Hazards Were Accelerated by Climate Change in Turkey and Syria. Um, have that article right here so you can see the cool cover photo um and it's in the february march 24 issue of geostrata on earthquake geotechnics um so this article provides a really interesting perspective on how earthquakes other geohazards and climate change can be linked i'm going to briefly introduce the authors and then we will dive in so chuche basser chuche can you say hello in, Hello, everyone. <laughs> she's an <laughs> assistant professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, specializing in geotechnical engineering and geomechanics. She received a PhD from UC San Diego in 2017. Tuche is originally from Madonna, which was one of the 11 cities that was impacted by the recent series of, her, of earthquakes that struck southern Turkey. Um, Ozgun Nomonoglu is a project geotechnical engineer at Schnabel Engineering in Seattle. He specializes Hello. in dynamic characterization and constitutive modeling of soils and analysis of seismic responses and soil structure interactions. Ozgun got his undergraduate degree from Middle East Technical University and PhD from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And he is also originally from Adana, so um, this is definitely up close and personal to all of these, um, all of these authors. Uh, finally, Sissy Nicolau is the immediate past president of Geo Institute. Uh, following more than 25 years of global consulting experience, she joined the National Institute of Standards and Technology 
as the leader of its earthquake engineering group in the materials and structural systems division. Her work is focused on advancing innovation related to resilience-based design and disaster, disaster risk reduction, and she's led reconnaissance after major extreme events around the world. So, all right. As Brad said, if you have questions for the authors, I encourage you to type them into the comments for this video while you watch, um, and we'll do our best to address them as time allows. We really want this to be an interactive experience, and um, we have some questions prepared, but if we can get them from the audience, that's even better. So welcome Tuche, Ospoon, and Sissy, and welcome everyone who came to watch. All right, first, Tuche, the title of the article was really compelling to me because at first glance, it would seem that earthquakes are a type of geohazard that isn't directly exacerbated by extreme weather and climate change, kind of the only one that seems to have a mind of its own. But the effects of earthquakes, like so much else on Earth, are impacted by climate change, as you explain in the article. I'm wondering if the resolu this revelation took you by surprise also, and where the original idea for linking earthquake-induced damage with climate change-related events came about. Um, for, um, once again, hello, everyone. Um, I'm really glad to be here with my co-authors, and thank you, GI team and Geostrata team, for giving us the opportunity to elaborate on our article. And also thank you to GI members who read Geostrata every uh, every single issue. So I got we got really good feedback uh, on our article, and it's our pleasure. So uh, going back to your question, Mary, um, I do not work for the government, as you just introduced me, but I need to make a disclaimer here first because uh, I've collaborated with government folks enough <laughs> to, to 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 follow a pro procedure. So. Uh, one thing that I think I need to um, emphasize here that we're not suggesting or discussing that climate change induces earthquakes uh, in this article and in our uh, research work. And however, there are studies in the literature and the popular magazines and popular um, uh, research uh, journals that you would see that uh, you would see an evidence or the studies uh, where they claim that um, climate change induces earthquakes. But here, we are only going to defend what we saw in our reconnaissance efforts and also what we observed and obtained from the um, observations or also other uh, resources. So um, to, to going back to your question, and these, the short answer is not really, because we've been talking about impacts of climate change and the technical system and infrastructure. This is also my background. Uh, in the past several decades, and there are direct effects of changes of climate change uh, in the, you know, um, and those patterns, how they are impacting our especially uh, geotechnical systems and critical infrastructure. Um, I've been, this this wasn't my first uh, reconnaissance, but this was my first earthquake reconnaissance. I've been to, I, I've um, participated in several reconnaissance efforts before, which was also a disaster was exacerbated or caused by the uh, the extreme weather events, extreme weather patterns, uh, such as Midwest Midwest flooding in 2019, Hurricane Ian 2022. Uh, and climate change is really a significant part of our lives now, and it should be a significant part of uh, should be a significant consideration for our civil engineering design. So there was a um, new term emerged uh, in the past uh, several decades, which is called cascading hazards, uh, because traditionally we were always investigating as researchers or practitioners, we were uh, trying to isolate the hazards and um, by it themselves and try to investigate them in within their framework. But now we see, uh, we are realizing that, I'm sorry, we are realizing that there are a lot of interaction interactions between especially um, climate patterns that are causing, exacerbating the, the hazards in the region. So uh, more specifically talking about after the brief uh, introduction, most more specifically speaking about this uh, event in Turkey, disaster in Turkey, when we were in the field, especially, I'm going to focus a little bit more on the the, the slope instability problem that we presented here uh, in this uh, article. Um, when we were doing uh, the reconnaissance and um, and then we, we came back, we collected a bunch of data from the field and we looked at the satellite images and not just in the area, but overall in Turkey and Syria. 
And there were several questions that came to our minds and we wanted to understand, we wanted to reveal uh, the answers for. So one of them specifically speaking about this uh, slope instability problem in alternative landslide, which is a translational landslide. Um, one of the questions was, was the slope already moving before the earthquake? Right, uh, because when we were talking with the locals, as you will mention this in a bit, probably, um, but there was a report of heavy rainfall before the earthquake and also unusual dry seasons before the earthquake in the past several years. And when you look at those historical weather data, um, because uh, when you look at those historical weather data, you would see a clear trend that there was a change uh, in the patterns. Right. So um, and then there were those several questions actually led us to think and investigate and deep dive a little bit uh, more uh, in the this in particular event and to understand those possible mechanisms which caused uh, that translational landslide. Yeah, so so. You this didn't take you by surprise in, in, in climate change impacts so many things. Were you able to estimate, and I guess I'll ask this to Osun, but any of you can really jump in. Were you able to estimate what would have happened if there had been no extreme weather? Like, did you have evidence that the landslide wouldn't have occurred or that it would have been um, less impactful? So I will first start with uh, if there was an extreme weather and how we identified it's a pot potential, and I'll go to the no extreme weather answers from there. As, as Tuche mentioned, our first interrogation of the potential engineering problem started at the field when we were doing the, the reconnaissance. The two, two distinct things happened when we were there. The first of them was uh, the locals. When we were listening to the locals and talking with them, they were mentioning that it was a very dry season, followed up with a, a extremely heavy rainfalls right before the earthquake, which we do know that rainfalls trigger landslides. And when we hear these from the locals living there, experiencing things. So we collected these uh, information and memories. And also we have found some water ponding in front of the landslide. And later when we came back to United States and we were looking at the reconnaissance documents that we collected and data, as Tuche mentioned, uh, the questions started to come up as that was this slope moving or like how, how how what was the rate of movement or was it a stable area so we started to ask these questions and then uh, collected some weather data around the area and then starting to integrate these different pieces it's uh, the the engineering problem started to become a little bit more clear that there is a potential link between the the weather event, extreme weather events that have uh, Play the potentially play the role in the acceleration of these this landslide that we have observed. So right now we are de detailed studying the uh, both the inside observations we are collecting and we will talk about these and the mechanics soil mechanics of the problem. And also we are not only working by ourselves. By the way, we brought experts to the to this problem and we are collaborating with uh, multiple people. In, at the INSAR side and the landslide mechanics side. Now, coming back to the original question, were we able to estimate what would happen if there had been no extreme weather? We don't know the answer yet, but we will be uh, after the. We are in the progress of uh, analyzing with and without the impacts of the extreme event, the mechanics of the landslide. We do not have the answer yet, but we will be able to provide some insights after our detailed study. Um, All right, great. I, well, if I can just contribute, if I can just contribute several yeah, of things course. to Ozun's um, uh, thoughts. So um, we, as he mentioned that we are working with experts, remote sensing experts, mechanics experts. Uh, this is a collaborative work uh, going on right now. And um, we will, so at the first glance, when you look at the pictures, you will just like see a um, very like harmless, innocent um, oil, uh, olive tree split, right? Which did not cause, um, you know, which did not cause any like deaths in the area. But the extent of the problem is a little bit bigger than that, and that's on that that is only um, also available uh, were available to us through those like remote sensing uh, technologies and uh, collaborative efforts as well. 
All right, got it. Um, I am wondering, speaking of the sensing, I'm wondering if you can get into some more detail on the tools you use to gather data like INSAR, UAVs, and how you integrated these to develop a nuanced picture of what was happening in the affected area. And so Chuja, you can start and other people are welcome to jump in. Sure. Um, so, I mean, first, of course, we used traditional tools and efforts, which is boots on the ground. We were there. And um, just going back a little bit um, in time, uh, when the first uh, earthquake first happened, we saw people tweet tweeting about that all of tree farm and those like possible mechanisms. From the pictures first and the several recordings, it looked like a full rupture, but then we ruled that out and realized that more information came, came in. Uh, that was a large mass movement and we went there. Um, but the scale of the failure, it's um, really big, right? So we are talking about about a 500 meter crack, like th more than 30 meter deep. And it was really necessary to use other tools to capture the full picture, not just in the split, surrounding the split as well. So immediately after the earthquake, our collaborator here, Dr. Nicolau, uh, when we were having conversations, she she uh, she made us, a, a, you know, she was willing to provide more information. Um, you know, those uh, we were discussing the satellite images uh, that were made available uh, immediately to the public, and she was very instrumental in that uh, reviewing those uh, images as well. So, and then. Um, we were there, um, we had a partner um, uh, from METU, um, Dr. Peck John and his crew, uh, they, they graciously agreed to, um, to, to help us in our reconnaissance efforts and we had a drone operator with, with us, which was an ex-military member. So as we can elaborate that uh, a little bit more. So there were a lot of tools different tools, uh, UAVs uh, and remote satellite images, uh, especially focusing on INSAR mostly, uh, that were made available to the public immediately after the earthquake by NASA and uh, European Space Agency. Uh, there were several tools, our own measurements in the field, our observations from the observations collected from UAVs and remote sensing. You see the difference in the scale because this is a uh, big scale and then bridging those scales was uh, really important for us. So maybe as you can contribute a little bit more. So that's how you were able to sort of go from like, well, maybe this is a fault rupture. What's sort of like what's connected and what's not and to like this is a major like a landslide over a vast area. Exactly, because the problem was not about the split itself. Right. Uh, so when we were uh, talking with locals, especially kids, when you're flying a UAV there, they, they surround They're you like, excited. <laughs> right? They're excited because they yeah. see you for the first time. And um, and then we started asking questions. Are there any cracks like this? I mean, not like this. We would see them from the satellite images, but uh, cracks that we missed, right? And then they were like, oh, there's like a little one uh, near our house, but it's not as big as this one. <laughs> we're like, we don't care. Can you take us there? It was like 300, about three. 500 meters away from the split. And that was probably the, the head scarf of the 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 the, the last one. There were there were like yeah. tension cracks and etc. So we went there and we have a funny story about this. So I'm gonna tell tell the story like uh throughout my life probably I would like to tell here too. Um we were like trying to we went to that uh smaller crack, the tension crack that um uh, that the kids were talking about. And there were several houses right next to each other. This is a rural area, right? And uh, there are no high-rise buildings. They're just uh, single-family homes or multi, you know, maybe uh, two-story buildings. And we were trying to figure out what had happened, uh, you know, because they were telling us that those uh, pipes um, that were the drainage pipes that are attached to the exterior wall of the, the buildings were shifted by about 50 centimeter. And then they were saying, oh, this was, you know, they shifted 50 centimeter and we fixed it. We were trying to make sense of it and we couldn't understand. We were like, okay, so this is not the the pipes in the ground because those drainage pipes, they're attached to the wall and they meet with the ground, right? So they fixed the ground and they were saying that the ground shifted, but we figured out that their whole house was shifted by 50 centimeter. Oh. It was not just the pipe, it was the whole house shifting. And 
there was this guy was telling us, oh, do you see the airport over there? It was like really far. We were like, yeah. And he was like, oh, we were not able to see that before, but now we can see it. <laughs> and it didn't occur to you that the UFO has shifted. Actually, that's why you're seeing the airport right now. So, yeah. Yeah, that's so funny. It's like, that's the type of things that you just wouldn't, in such a large, when you're looking over such a large area, you would never know to like where to make the measurements. Um, I've never been involved in an effort like that, but it sounds so interesting to sort of that's, piece together. That's where, things UAV, with people. that's where UAVs yeah, come from. Yeah, yeah. Very, very handy. Very mm -hmm. handy. And also for safety as well, safety concerns, right? So yeah. uh, there were like several places that we were just not really say, I mean, we could have done that, but we just were careful uh, because we were in a, Although it's our country, but it's in a foreign country, and we were on a mission, <laughs> so we had to be careful. So UAV, that's that's why UAV especially uh, helped us to to get the full picture, and also uh, we sent it to the places that you know we were not able to go. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, all right, Sissy, this one is for you. And we, we talked about you know your experience in the rural area and engaging with the community members. Um, in the article, you acknowledge that rural and economically disadvantaged communities are at inherently greater risk for damage from earthquakes and other extreme events. Um, I know this has come up with things like hurricanes as well. Um, so that means climate change is likely to have more negative impacts on these areas. What kind, this is a very broad question, so take it where you like, but what kind of policy changes, research, or funding allocations could help to improve this inequity and how can civil engineers get involved in moving the needle? It is evident that um, in inequalities become even more evident after an extreme event. And using technologies like the UAVs or the IMSARS and the imaging, you can immediately see it. Now, when you are adding the exposure to climate effects, this is only going to get worse. And um, uh, these communities are going to be affected even more. So what we can do about it as civil engineers is <clears throat> think about the way we do uh, geotechnical design. It does not affect community resilience. It affects a factor of safety for certain parameters that could even be altered to account for extreme rainfall or um, different climate conditions. However, it does not include how our designs affect communities. We are not trained to do that. Our brains do not go there, but that's exactly what is happening. So it takes a shift of mindset, I think for everybody involved in climate change issues, that we need to think more globally. And it's not necessarily a um, funding um, issue. It's how we invest this funding, because if we are, to, um, as we like to call it, you know, you know chase a hazard and um, chase the demand side of what our codes impose on us. So the 100-year flood is now going to be the 500-year flood, and we think that we are safer. That is not the case. That is not, I think, the solution. The solution is more towards a new engineering thinking that has to do with decision support for those that make policy, for those that give the funding, where the priorities are and where the priorities are have to, to, to be a combination of engineering thinking and needs of the communities and where we have more vulnerabilities. Um, <clears throat> and there are examples of things that worked well. I, we always like to look at things that work well in um, and there were examples of resilience one of them are the behavior of schools in turkey there are so many people that said i wish the earthquake had happened in a time that my kids were in school regardless of geographic location so something worked well there and we need to learn from that so um it is a decision that has to do with uh, at large i would say people's well-being beyond life safety going into people's um, living better and be happier and be safer. And that takes a lot of change. And um, I think it's up to starting from the bottom up and from up down 
to change our minds on how we allocate funds in order to account for social economic inequities that are going to be uh, evident and they're going to be even more evident from climate effects as we move forward. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense and it's it's definitely like <laughs> a lot to wrap your head around but um I think doing as much as we can as civil engineers to kind of learn about where where the industry is headed and making sure we're paying attention to um to different to different guidelines but um sometimes it feels as civil engineers like we have very little control over you know we're designing yeah. to this factor of safety we're designing to what we what right, we're told right. but right but i think and the gi has been extremely active on this it's one yeah. of our priorities in our new strategic plan is that as we all know and we should keep saying this to ourselves uh, building codes are a minimum for design Building codes are not meant to constrain innovation. They're not meant to um, to stop us from thinking differently. And I think the combination of things that other people may not see obvious. I mean, we had seen this coming with climate and earthquake and everybody, when you, you talk about this and you just uh, expressed it very uh, nicely, it's like, we, we don't mean that more earthquakes are happening because of climate, but, we as engineers are thinking demand, 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 you know, what is the force? The force in your um, potential slope, um, as in, in the cases of landslides, is not going to change, but your capacity in terms of your soil properties, your geometry, your fatigues is going to change. So it's the other part of the factor of safety equation that usually we don't think of because that's how we designed it. We have done the borings, we uh, hopefully, uh, which is not always the case, we have done this and that. So, um, you know, it's up to, um, and I, I'm extending more into the Geo Institute because I think our audience is mainly geotechnical uh, engineers. And this is a a huge challenge because it's very difficult to address it, but it, it's also a challenge and an opportunity to um, uh, to claim leadership by the geoprofessionals to solve this because we deal with more uncertainty than anybody else. And it is up to us. Do we want to continue using the old mentality that traces almost a century you know, it's not a, it's not a ten year thing, or do we want to think more globally and then lead, be part of where decisions are being made? This is the discussion that you know comes out of big, uh, horrible tragedies like this one. Yeah, and I think it's like getting involved in societies and knowing where 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 policies and guidance is changing, but also I would imagine on a project that you are involved in it's like sort of thinking about what are the vulnerabilities here and what can should what are we missing any you know weak weak points that we should be considering if this is an area that is disaster prone or potentially could be right absolutely yeah um okay no that's a great answer and a lot to think about um so the next question i have is for touche so um you mentioned the workshop Emerging and Disruptive Technologies to Enhance Disaster Resilience. You mentioned that at the end of the article. Um, so one of the workshop outcomes is that data collected from various field campaigns and disciplines must be standardized to provide consistency across all platforms. Um, data standardization is definitely a um, is that something that I really enjoy thinking and talking about and something I've been working on. So I'm wondering if you can describe some specific types of data that would benefit from this um, improved consistency? Um, sure. So um, I'm, I would like to start with why do we want to standardize data to data? So it's because easier processing, right, faster processing and of the information that we are collecting for faster conclusions, because in an emergency, we want to be able to make a decision immediately. So the more data come in and the more the, and we understand the type of the data and even the format of the data, it's very important. And it's also it's, I've seen I've attended several workshops that was um, um, uh, that that was 
um, organized by um, National Science Foundation on the um, Natural Hazards uh, Engineering Institute and Research Institute. And uh, that was like one of the biggest uh, thing, like biggest topic that every single working table was talking about data standardization. I remember several years ago when I was at one of those new workshops, I, we had social scientists on the table. There were geomechanics person, geotechnical engineer, and weather uh, climate scientists, and you know, like social scientists. And we were all like talking about because these people are all of us are involved when there's a disaster, right? So we go to the field and we perform reconnaissance. And it's always like you said. The, the one of the main outcomes of any type of workshop focusing on this is the data standardization. Mm -hmm. But you don't really know. I mean, I'm really glad that you asked this question. I mean, we always know that it's necessary that to do that, but I haven't seen any attempt of, uh, on my part as my per from my personal experience. I, I haven't seen any attempts to 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 do that actually. So um, so then to explain a little bit like in detail, um, and also I would like to express this is really important data standardization. It's really important for the disaster resilience because we will like to um, have accurate maps, right? So to be able to do risk assessment and especially in the emergency uh, response planning. And I think one thing that became really important from these discussions from the workshops that I attended and from the workshop that I organized uh, is that the, the the main type of data that everyone was interested was the geospatial data. So the geospatial data which includes you know um, any type of information like um, you know geographic coordinates, elevation, land cover, you know, any other spa uh, spatial attributes are very, very important. So everyone was like talking about, because as geotechnical engineers, from my experience from the reconnaissance, what I go and, and during a reconnaissance I collect is just, I document um, which foundation failed, you know, I take pictures, right? I take pictures which are um, geotagged. So those are, even now we are uh, experiencing some difficulties like using those um, geotag pictures to be able to pinpoint and figure out, you know, okay, where this picture was taken, right? So accurate documentation, especially in terms of geospatial data became really important from my own experiences as well, so. So has there been an effort among that group of like, kind of on a broader level, setting some guidelines for like how you collect photos, how you how you georeference things, um, how you measure things. Yeah, so um, I think one thing that I was really glad to see during, especially during our reconnaissance uh, last year, uh, was that um, there is a um, open source uh, software um, that where you, you know, um, it's developed for geotechnical engineers, uh, first of all, as civil engineers, but where you could go and take pictures and upload those pictures on a platform, right? So, and it will immediately uh, take that geolocation that your phone takes that even you can take pictures with your phone and put in a system. So for example, when I go to that platform, when I click on the picture, I will be able to see where that uh, incident or the failure happened mm -hmm. and what kind, what type of failure. So um, there are guidelines, uh, you know, that are described by the people, by the group, which was developed by METU, by the way, in Turkey. Um, there are guidelines as to how you should enter the data, but we were also part of the developing the guidelines as well. So, and there were like several discussions among the group what type of failure should we tag and how we should name them how would people understand when they go to the uh you know to the portal and and those type of things yeah that makes a lot of sense um and i think that's that's so important um so you also mentioned as a workshop outcome that quantum computing could be the solution to many issues and challenges faced today and um, can help with early warning systems 
Can you talk more about quantum imaging and quantum computing and what role they would play? Absolutely. So this is my I know you're excited favorite. to nerd out on this one. <laughs> this is my favorite uh, question in the list. So a little bit of background, if you don't mind. Um, I'm an, uh, a researcher who likes to do interdisciplinary work, multidisciplinary work. And if, if people who know me very well from my researcher side, they would always, you know, you would hear the same thing that I, I used to say, there is only one single um, discipline that I cannot relate my research with, <laughs> and that was quantum. <laughs> and now <laughs> I am collaborating with a quantum physicist <laughs> on, several, <laughs> on several different projects, which is also related with climate change, by the way, climate change and permafrost. So that's why as soon as I saw this uh, question list, I called him and I said, hey, there's a question about your expertise. So, and I don't want to mess this up. <laughs> Can you please help me <laughs> answering this question? Because I, I mean, I knew nothing about quantum until I met him last year. We started collaborating. So he gave me a couple of pointers <laughs> and he was like, okay, you can mention this and that. So I'm going to be quoting several things from his responses, by the way. So uh, he's a uh, Shahin Ozdemir, he's a professor at Penn State uh, in engineering mechanics. <laughs> so um, so he explained to me uh, quantum, uh, if you, I mean, we all heard of it by, um, like by meaning quantum means how much, the quantity, right? So there are like several, any, if a quantity of a physical process, so it sounds simple. And I ask him, okay, can you please describe it uh, a quantum in a way that I can explain to a child? He was like, that I cannot do. <laughs> that's a very complex, but you know, you can just say that's the quantity of a physical process. So um, there are several things. I mean, there are three different technologies that are uh, that uh, you know that are progressing right now. The first one is the quantum imaging, quantum computing, and quantum for security, for information science. So there are like three major things. Uh, and even my um, interactions with uh, folks at, at DC from the government, they all talk about these three major topics. And we do, I mean, and disasters or emergency response are all related with these three quantum topics. I can uh, start with that. But um, so he also mentioned that um, there is a significant progress, especially in research in quantum computing and in involving quantum algorithms, which are expected to solve computationally hard and costly problems. So which is our case, right? So disaster happened, earthquake happened in Turkey and Syria. Power was out, but there was a lot of information coming in. There were a lot of data sets that we, we had to deal with. We didn't know where they were coming from. We didn't know the, you know, the, the size was big, right? And we really need that uh, quantum computing technologies or quant advancements in the quantum computing, which is a promising, we, don't, we do not do it yet, but um, they can be a, um, they can play the, the biggest role in processing the information using the computing, like faster algorithms for decision-making. Because one thing that I can relate this with, for three days, um, no one knew the extent of the earthquake. For three days, from my own personal experience, when I talk with my sister, right, the, the, after the first um, earthquake, we were FaceTiming, and she called us and she said, oh, there was an earthquake in Diyarbakir. And we felt it in Adana. And then I saw like tweets, there was an earthquake in Malatya. There was an earthquake in Kahraman Marash. There was an earthquake. Everyone was like reporting, uh, you know, several different things, like different things, right? So there was a lot of information coming, but no one made the connection until the third day. No one knew that Hatay, Antakya was destroyed until second day. Wow. And then, so um, that's, again, um, there are different informations, right? Different, different information coming in and you need a faster percent. 
And one thing that unfortunately we failed um, in the emergency response is that until third day, there was no um, you know, rescue efforts effectively working in those areas. And one can, you know, um, one can just argue that, okay, the extent was too big and we were not ready. Yes, but maybe we can be ready with this uh, faster processing, right? And by faster decision making. So, and also even quantum computing with those enhanced algorithms, because everything works faster. So for example, how, I'm not sure for folks who do numerical modeling, which I do, I was just running a model yesterday on a one single physics, which is heat transfer. You know, I was trying to understand how heat is uh, propagating. Uh, and it was just one single, it's not even a coupled model, but it takes like six hours to solve it, right? Six hours. So, and when we're talking about uh, this complicated processes, earthquake, then, you know, the cascading hazards, so to be able to figure out what exactly happened and to be able to process, we, we would need those and that will, they, they will play the, the biggest role. And when it comes to quantum imaging in this workshop, there was also a, another quantum um, mechanics from a person from Japan. And they, he talked about how quantum sensing can be crucial uh, in this emergency response because um, quantum imaging can enhance sensing by providing more accurate and sensitive data for monitoring. And also it would provide improved resolution. And one thing that actually st uh, struck me the most that he told us that we are already using quantum and the remote sensing. I, that I didn't know. So we are already integrating those um, and and also going back to the quantum uh, computing. So that would help, you know, improve accuracy uh, of detecting devices, reduce the time and etc. And also can analyze the really large data sets uh, from sensors and satellite because again, we didn't know at first hand, but NASA already knew the extent, right, from those satellite images. European right. Space Agency already knew from the satellite images. But the resolution of those images can be improved by quantum imaging, right, in the improvements in the quantum imaging and the data processing as to what happened and figuring out how they are interrelated, those complex things can be improved with quantum computing. I hope this was helpful. I didn't <laughs> get into too many like in the technical details, but I can do it too. <laughs> That's okay. I that makes sense. Like you're kind of linking. So it's we have a lot of data. We need to be able to. We need capacity to make meaning out of that data quickly, and that ultimately will help us be able to you know be more responding, uh, be more responsive to disasters, and be able to better like um, better predict them, figure out where they happened, um, and just do more with the data more quickly. I can I can see why that would be important because this is it can be very overwhelming and hard to get a handle on. And I can see why a lot yeah, of computer exactly. power would help with that. Exactly, because you know, like I mentioned, this is a very complex process, like complex mechanisms to figure out. It's not just like one single strike and then you have your buildings collapse and people yeah. like it's not just that, right? There are a lot of other environmental factors that are in play and social factors, environmental factors, and to be able to process them, like, you know, because like um, as Sissy mentioned, um, we are coming, now we're expanding our understanding um, in the holistic approach, right? So to those building costs, how would that be possible? Because we tend to simplify things in our, even our brains work that way. We tend, to, we process simpler information better and faster, right? And um, so that's why, um, our efforts so far, I, I, I can talk about this a little bit more, but um, traditionally when I look back, uh, everything is, you know, we are trying to solve our geotechnical engineering problems or designs in the one simple empirical equation, right? So that is derived from a physics. But now we are um, 
promoting that, okay, so this cannot be handled by a single physics. Like as a researcher who do a lot of multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary research, um, so I can also I also claim that in my research proposals, for example, okay, this cannot be explained by a single physics. So we, we need to bring in this expertise, that expertise, but we do not have enough capacity right now to, to I mean, we can, we, we definitely provide a really good holistic perspective, holistic approach, we, we propose framework, but we do need the infrastructure to be able to actually do that. Yeah, no, that's super interesting. Um, all right, so the question was posed, I'm not sure where it came from, but I'm going to integrate this into the next one I had for you, Sissy. We, we can touch on this briefly because we kind of already talked about this question in your previous answer, but um, how can we as engineers, designers, contractors think differently about earthquake prone areas as climate change progresses and should we be expecting guidance to change over time in response to um, work like what you all have done in Turkey? And then I guess I want you to also incorporate the answer um, to why, why is it important specifically that the U.S. government get involved in reconnaissance after disasters from your perspective? Yeah, I think it's it's um, very important for the whole engineering com uh, community, but also the government agencies to be involved in reconnaissance. Obviously, uh, in geotechnical engineering, we have the NSF-funded gear um, association that does this and does it very well for many, many years now. Actually, they had they had early on developed a process for geotagging, which is not as robust and as, as um, uh, in the early times, I'm talking, you know, before uh, year started after the 1999 earthquake. So it's been a few decades, um, but these um, issues of uh, identifying methods to use technology to our benefit to learn from events is very important. But it's also a um, kind of, uh, you get what you wish for, now what? And this is where we need to go interdisciplinary. So what Tuche was describing is that what we are trying to solve on a community level is extremely complex. And when you are thinking about decision support for community level problems, so if your house is going to be safe and can be occupied is a function of many different things where the safety of the house is only one thing. If the water lifeline trans network is not working, you cannot go in your house. If the electricity doesn't work, you cannot go in your house. If all the other houses have, been, have collapsed, cannot go in your house. If there is contagious disease that are going on around you, you cannot go in your house. So it's not just one thing, as Tu just said. So in order to do simulations at that scale, ideally to include all what consists, what things make a community, computationally, it's extremely difficult. At NIST, we have an excellent center for resilience. They do test bed simulations that include that. This is extremely time consuming. You cannot, you need to go out of your comfort zone to find solutions. Sometimes this out of your comfort zone comes out by just talking to people. So when we were talking and trying to support Tuja and Osgun in the field, uh, I reached out to the disasters um, division of NASA and I said, you, we need, you know, maps before, maps after, we need to know how much rain was falling, all of these things. And by talking to the amazing people they have there, which is very funny, right? Because Tuja and Osgun and I were like, oh, we're talking to NASA, they are so cool. So when we were telling them what we do, they said, oh, you guys are so cool, <laughs> which is great, right? Um, so um, uh, so um, what they were saying is that, okay, we can give you this and that, and we need to work a little bit on this and that. And they said, oh, would you like to know exactly what time um, the lights went off across, you know, a whole huge area we were looking at? And we said, what? You can do that? And they're like, yeah, we're NASA, we can do that. We have, we monitor that. And we didn't even ask why you monitor that and why you have this. Of course we want to know, because that's very important. It says something to us, right? We, we never went asking for this. Um, so I think it's very important 
And I could mention that there is a new circular, uh, since you asked me about agencies that is coming out, uh, it's a USGS circular. It's an update after a decade long, um, older version of how NEHERP, which is a na national earthquake hazard reduction program, should respond to earthquakes. And in there, there is a component, significant component, that talks about geotechnical data, geotagging, and how um, this data could be used in a way that is structured and unbiased to inform decisions moving forward. Um, so this is led by USGS with the contributions of the other agencies of NEHERP, which is NSF and, um, and uh, NIST and FEMA. Now, going to um, how we can think differently, I think we, we discussed this a, a, a little bit about big picture and, and, and uh, when, you, when you come to the level of how this is going to only get worse with climate, um, one thing that uh, I would refer to the same issue of geostrata where we have the future of seismic codes. We have another article there uh, where we talk about going beyond the concept of um, functional recovery or even a return period of an earthquake, but rather to, um, uh, to how long it takes us to recover whether it is how long it takes us to go back to our house, how long does the highway uh, going to be in full capacity. Uh, so that is called uh, functional recovery. It is um, a framework at this point or a suggestion for frameworks, which was produced at the request of the US Congress to um, NIST and FEMA. It is available online, it was published in 2021, but it includes this um, this new concept of time, which is something very quantifiable, and also what I think is very important to the question you posed on how we we as engineers can incorporate climate and earthquake and all these extreme events is is communicating. So um, you know I'm not sure how how well we communicate what a one in twenty five hundred year earthquake means to a person that thinks that this only happens once in 2,500 years uh, versus in introducing a parameter that says it's going to take you six months to go back to your office for your office to be operable. It's going to take a year for your kid's school to be open. Now, how do you translate that into engineering and design and codes? It's a big challenge, right? And this is our job to solve challenges, right? It's not to run numbers on a computer. Um, so I think that this is, um, you know, the new frontier. And it's also something that does not have a single answer. It is um, a different decisions that give you different benefits and give different benefits to different things going back to inequity and issues, socioeconomic issues, as well as, um, structural issues, structural damage issues. And we know that where the losses are and where the disasters have the huge impact is not at this point so much structural. It is this functionality of our systems. And I, I can use Christchurch as the biggest example of this, like yes. how long it took them to go back. We also know from um, um, uh, for, for from studying hurricanes, that this is evident. It's not the structural damage that is, and by structural, I also mean, mean foundation damage necessarily. It is the flooding of the subways, the 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 non the non ability to function as a community. Now, I, I don't know that the question becomes, you know, how you turn that into codes. And that is something we all have to work together for and have stakeholder discussions from the community uh, representatives to politicians, to contractors, to developers, and break that, that notion that this costs more. The, the, the issue of money is how wise you invest 
this money because we can go after a disaster and, and throw money into it and rebuild the same way. How is this going to help us or our children or our grandchildren in the future? We know what the result is going to be. We have the observational method. We are very good at observing things. So um, I think that uh, talking about this, thinking differently, and trying to push the envelope, having also a dollar amount next to it, so we can prove our concepts. And this is where computationally advanced technologies are needed, because um, you cannot do that with, a, I call it with a naked eye. What I think is yes. uh, uh, you, you, Mary knows that better than uh, than me for sure, is that when you look at a highway system, if you choose what is the most vulnerable asset, it's not gonna give you the maximum return to service. Uh, it depends on so many stuff that have to do with redundancy. It has to do with, with a, a lot of many other things that we cannot do them by hand or with conventional geotechnical and structural analysis so yeah. It, yeah. It, you know it's it's a it's a challenge and it it only has climate is only adding a huge but also urgent demand uh, on this challenge climate is not something that we oh we have 500 years to solve right we are we have issues here that need to be solved in the next um decade and even less right i know yeah, it's just like we have this moving target, but like related, we also have advanced tools that can help us deal with that moving target in theory. But in terms of the interdisciplinary thing, that's so that's really interesting perspective. Like, it's like okay, having these. I imagine I don't know. I don't remember where I heard about this, but it's like people building like their little de geodesic indestructible, <laughs> do geodesic dome indestructible houses. <laughs> That are then going to end up with like no way to survive. You know, they're going to end up with no community around them, and um, if if the whole community were to fall apart, so it's like, is the road going to fail? Is the electric grid going to fail? And what ha what's the um, what's the weak point in terms of getting everything back together as fast as possible? It's not just about life safety. Um, and I imagine that's also why it's important for federal agencies to get involved because like. In, if everybody can collaborate on sharing data, ideally, like that's where a lot of that information lies um, to be able to. And it, it's also um, working on this this topic, right? We hold workshops to understand, you know, for you, you know, turn, returning back home and, and occupy your, your home in six months may be okay. For me, it might be I want to be there tomorrow, right? Yeah. We hold workshops of different stakeholders about what this time should be. And these times obviously should be different on the use of the asset. It's a different for a hospital versus a residential home or an agricultural yeah. facility. It's different for a highway system that has redundancies and can work at least partially. So it is really uh, interesting how much consistency you get in the answers from a diverse group of stakeholders that at the, at the end of the day, we are not that different because one of us is an engineer, the other one is a mayor, the other one is a family who lives there. It, it's yeah. pretty consistent. So um, I, I see, I'm optimistic about, about that as we open, we open a dialogue and, and we talk about these things. Yeah, that I that's great. I love it. Um, so we're we're getting close to wrapping up here. Um, Osgun, I want to know though. You attended the reconnaissance in Turkey with Tuche. Um, what is the most impactful memory from that visit for you? What what's your what's one of your biggest takeaways? So I, I do not know if I mentioned this before, but that was my first professional reconnaissance in my in my career. And if I may give this answer, uh, entire reconnaissance itself is a memory to to be remembered. And I am sure anyone who have been participated in a post disaster reconnaissance will agree with me on this one. Any any reconnaissance that you you attend to is a, itself a memory. But if I if I choose a specific one, uh, we were 
there was one moment that kind of shaped my perspective a little bit more than anything else that we were on a way to go do some measurements for some buildings in in the in the Hatay region and then we stopped by near a, a military camp so the people were you know gathering together and living like a, getting to the tents and trying to get water and in fact Tuche will remember this too uh, there was a one old lady that approached to us we were in a reconnaissance you know big reconnaissance uh, useful car and she asked if we can help her to carry the waters. Like she had like these gallons of water she had to carry from point A to point B. And our immediate reaction was like, yes, of course, you know, we, we were like, we were in an engineering mission there, but you know, a, a person approached us because she was in need to carry the stuff. And that moment I, I kind of recognized, you know, whatever we do, regardless of being an engineer, doing a measurement there, or helping people, we are doing it for people who who are suffering from you know post disaster conditions. And I, I try to tie it to my entire profession, saying you know that that solid memory kind of shaped my perspective a little bit on you know whatever we are doing in a in an engineering profession. At the end of the day, we are doing it for 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 people and uh, for them to either uh, prevent uh, suffering of a post disaster or or, or prepare for a rapid re recovery. So that, that little tiny memory that I have is I'm, I'm carrying it over to my uh, whole perspective on approaching the, the engineering problems, yeah. Yeah, that's that's great. I mean, that's why many of us became civil engineers, I think. Um, Touche, do you have anything to add to that? Well, yeah, I do remember that moment, exact moment, but I think like Uzgun mentioned, um, the entire experience was memorable. Um, it's memorable and we won't remember, we won't forget any details um, in our lives probably. But I, uh, for me, it was like three of us in the car. We were, we covered like several places. We started from Adana and as we were getting closer to the epicenter of the earthquake, um, the destruction was, you know, um, bigger. And then we knew that Antakya especially, like the, the central Hatai, was in a really bad shape. And everyone was like telling us, don't go there, don't go there. And we still wanted to go, uh, right? Because we were doing doing our job there, but for people, like Özgün mentioned. But I do remember an ex-military guy in the car, Özgün and I, right? So... We were like, and all of us was like, okay, let's not go there. Let's not go there because we were not ready. And we have seen, we had seen a lot until that point. But we were like, let's not go to the, the, the center, like to downtown, because we thought that we wouldn't be able to take it. So we were just in the neighborhoods, you know, like surrounding neighborhoods, like, ex you know, a little bit, um, uh, in the suburbs, I would say, suburbs of the uh, central Hatay. But um, we didn't have the courage to go there. And I've seen, again, before uh, in my previous reconnaissance, uh, especially in the Hurricane Ian, I've seen a lot of destroyed houses. But for me, it was more, you know, when it's your home, it hits the heart, right? It was very emotional and we couldn't go. Yeah, that had to have been really intense. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, so I think, unless there's any further questions from the audience, I know we've gone a little over the hour, but um, we're going to wrap it up. So Brad, you can pop back on if you'd like. I like how you specifically tell me I can do that. Nobody else does that except you, Mary, when you host these things. So I appreciate <laughs> it. Very direct. And I, I want to say thanks to to our Osgun and Tuche and Sissy for sharing these stories too. I think, you know, we talked about it in some episodes of Director's Cut. One that I remember specifically was with Ellen Rathke, and she talked about going to uh, Haiti after the 2010 earthquake and how a lot of their work there became almost like sociology in talking to the people who had been affected. And it's almost less about the engineering work that you're there to do than it is just being a helpful face from the outside for people to, to talk to. And she talked about how they went to this area of, I can't remember which specific city it was, that was completely devastated. 
and there there was a, a grandmother in a house there who was insistent on making everybody in, in the reconnaissance team tea. And that was like the single most important thing to her, even with all the destruction that was surrounding her. So those are absolutely incredible stories. And I think obviously when it hits your hometown, you know, nobody, as weird as this is, psychologically, nobody in New Orleans thought that Katrina would happen to them. Nobody in Tehran ever thought that, you know, that the, the I don't know if it was the bomb earthquake or which one it was, thought that that would happen to them. It's it's a very different environment. So I want to thank you guys for sharing all your stories and, and talking about why this was so important to you. And everybody should definitely go read the article. We linked to it in just about everything we sent out promoting this event today. And we'll continue to do that as we go forward. So for everybody who watched this, thanks for participating today. We hope you liked it. You're here at the end, so you probably did. So do that, do that magic clicky thing and click like, subscribe, and get notifications, and we'll let you know every time we post something to the YouTube channel. Our next live stream is just two days away, and it's going to be March 14th. That is Pi Day for all of you math fans out there. And we will have Eric Jensen from the University of Colorado at Boulder talking about math, talking about Pi, and talking about why math is so important to geotechnical engineering. So you can join us for that at 2 p.m. on this Thursday. And then next week, we have a live stream with McAfee talking about pinned drapery systems. Probably no pies in that one, but it'll still be good. I would encourage everybody to register. So thanks again, Mary. Thank you, Tuche, Sissy, Osgoon, for doing this today. It was fantastic. It was a good time. Matt Roberts was our producer today, his first time. So very well done for Matt. Thank you for doing it. And we will see everybody with our next live stream in just a couple of days. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. That'll tell us when we're on.